Hey guys, welcome to my channel. So we are here with the fourth part of this chapter, Rise of Nationalism in Europe. We have one more part left and then we are done with this chapter. I know it's a very big chapter, but then it is as important as that. So if you didn't check out those three lectures of mine, do check them out. And as you guys know, I'll be doing with NCRT. I don't make notes for history. That's all I do make. Right, because in here, everything is important. The making of Germany and Italy. Germany, can the army be the architect of a nation? Okay, now they're asking us a question. They're putting forward a question for us to answer by reading this. After 1848, nationalism in Europe moved away from its association with democracy and revolution. Uh, the previous one or the previous part was wherein we looked on the age of revolutions. We came through many revolutions like July revolutions and, and more like that. Nationalist sentiments were often mobilized by conservatives for promoting state power and achieving political domination over Europe. So they're just, they're just giving us a small sum about the previous part of the chapter. This can be observed in the process by which Germany and Italy came to be unified as a nation state. As you have seen, nationalist feelings were widespread among middle class Germans. See, everywhere, the first people who got influenced was the middle class people who were educated to a minimal level. The poor and ultra rich were not at all on this conservative measures. They found uh, the rich were greedy and they, they, they did not consider uh, freedom, right? They, they thought they are the superior ones, they, they have equality. But the poor ones thought they are not up to the mark in order to, or they were not educated to know that they also require the same freedom as that of the rich people. So the middle class ones were the ones which knew these things. And they went forward with it, who in 1848 tried to unite the different regions of German confederation into a nation state governed by an elected parliament. So after all, the main thing that they were all, all the countries or the nations were trying to do just one thing, making an elected body so that the people can elect the rulers rather than the monarchy form. This liberal initiative to nation building was, however, repressed by the combined forces of monarchy and the military supported by large landowners of Russia. So this elected parliament sort of things was repressed because see, the kings, uh, the military, then the large landowners wouldn't, wouldn't like the freedom to go or wouldn't prefer an equality uh, for all the people. The monarchy would prefer ruling over the people when the landowners will enjoy continue to be uh, rich. They, they won't prefer to have their well-being transferred to the poor people or have an equal status in, in the place, right? They wanted a superiority in their thing. So such a landlorders were called junkers of Russia, right? So this was happening in Russia. From then on, Prussia took on the leadership of the movement for national unification. So Prussia became the national or the head of all these things from that time onwards. Its chief minister, I want you guys to remember it, okay? Uh, its chief minister, Otto von Bismarck, was the architect of this process carried out with the help of Prussian army and bureaucracy. Three wars over seven years. Three wars over seven years with Austria, Denmark, and France ended in Prussian victory and completed the process of unification. So Prussia led to the expansion of the territory. They uh, they made Austria. They defeated Austria, Denmark, and France under the excellence of Otto von Bismarck. I want you to remember his name. It's an important name. He plays an important role in Prussian history. Okay. In uh, January 1871, the Prussian king, William I, was proclaimed German emperor, emperor uh, in a ceremony held at Versailles. So it's a place uh, in Prussia, a place in Versailles is there. That's where the Prussian emperor um, or the king, William I, was put on the throne after all the unification been done. Okay. So this is uh, this is the uh, uh, main question that comes from this part of the chapter, basically the fourth part of the chapter, this is one of the main questions that comes about the pressure direct questions can come. Okay. On the bitterly cold morning of 18th January, such dates are an important if you have a good memory and if you're able to memorize well and good or else such um, dates are important. Okay. On the bitterly cold morning of 18th January, 1871, an assembly comprising the Prince of German States, representatives of army, Important Prussian ministers, including the chief minister, Otto von Bismarck, gathered in the unheated hall, hall of Mirrors in the Palace of Versailles to proclaim the new king, a uh, new empire, 
uh, headed by Kaisa Volume 1 of Russia. So his full name is this. So this was a ceremonial thing. It was during the morning of 18 January 1871. It was um, held in presence of all the excellent people like the ministers you can remember this uh, the representative of army Prussian ministers including the author von Bismarck and it was he, uh, held in unheated wall hall of mirrors at the palace in Versailles to proclaim the new emperor which is Kaiser William I okay the nation building process in Germany had demonstrated the dominance of Prussian state power the new state placed a strong emphasis on modernizing the currency banking legal and judicial system in Germany. Prussian measures and practices often became a model for the rest of Germany. So Prussian was kind of a role model. So they, the moment they got, um, the moment New Kim came to power, there was a strong change in one of the main, you know, the country's main things, the banking, money, the transportation. These are some of the main key things that a nation should focus on once they get their form. So the new state, uh, like held a strong emphasis on modernizing the currency, banking, le legal, and judicial system. So these are some of the main important things that a nation should look after once they get their new things, right? So this all happened under the King William. So Italy unified, just like Germany. So this was all the story about Germany. Germany, let's have a revision on that. Germany, what happened? It was, uh, they were not preferring an elected parliament, rather they wanted a king system. Even armies were against it. Land honors were against it, which, got, which is called Junkers in Russia. And it or the unification took place under Otto von Bismarck, who was the architect of this plan. Uh, they held Austria, Denmark, and France. And then they had the new King William I, which was held in the Hall of Mirrors of Versailles, right? Um, yeah, and then they look on. They looked on the for, uh, forward. Or like they looked on improving the currency, legal, judicial system, banking, and stuff. So this was about Germany, and that is it. Now we're moving on to Italy. Italy unified, like Germany, Italy too had a long history of political fragmentation. Italians were scattered over several dynastic states as well as multinational Habsburg Empire. During the middle of the nineteenth century. Italy was divided into seven states of which only one, Sardinia Piedmont, was ruled by an Italian princely house. The north was under Austrian Habsburgs, the center was ruled by the Pope, and the southern regions were under the domination of Bourbon kings of Spain. Even the Italian language had not acquired one common form and still had many regional and uh, local variations. So one of the main trouble I feel, or it's what has been explained in here, is that they didn't have a sort of unification in anything, even not even language. Even in the language, the slang, the accent is different for each of the people in Italy, all over. You can see this. In Italy was divided to seven states, of which only one was under a princely ruler. The north was by uh, under Austrian Habsburg, centered by Pop. Pop is the main person of uh, the Christian community. Southern regions were under the domination of the Bourbon kings of Spain. So this was what problem of Italy. They had a different, they were, they were different. They didn't have something called a unification. And if there's no unity, a proper nation cannot be formed. During the 1830s, Giuseppe Mazzini had sought to put together a coherent program for a unitary, uh, unitary Italian Republic. So the guy is Giuseppe Mazzini. He had also formed a secret society called Young Italy. If you guys remember his name in the first part of the chapter, he formed this uh, groups called Young Italy and One More Young, something like that, for the uh, dissemination of his goal. So he had formed the secret societies like Young Italy. Remember anyone, Young Italy? This was under the Giuseppe Mazzini. He had done a lot in order for the unification of Italy. The failure of revolutionary uprising both in 1831 and 1848 meant that the mantle now fell on Sardinia Piedmont under his ruler, King Victor Emmanuel, to unify the Italian states to war. In the eyes of ruling allies of this region, a unified Italy offered them the possibility of economic development and political dominance. So again, the King Victor Emmanuel II had to take the initiative to war to, you know, like, uh, unify the Italian states because they found the economic development and political dominance will increase when this unity. Chief Minister Kewa, 
who led the movement to unify the regions of Italy, was neither a revolutionary nor a democrat. Like many other wealthy and educated members of Italian elite, he spoke French much better than he did Italian. Through a tactful diplomatic alliance with France, uh, engineered by Caver, Sardinia Piedmont succeeded in defeating the Austrian forces in 1859. So this was under the Excellency Chief Minister Caper. Right? He was not a revolutionary, he was not a democrat. He just wanted uh, he was an ed educated man of a society. He he spoke much better French than Italian. Has much other uh, Italian people there. And so by his um, brilliance or idea, they were able to defeat Austrian forces in 1859. Apart from red troops, a large number of armed office volunteers under the leadership of Guesep uh, Garbaldi joined the free. In 1860, they marched into South Italy and the Kingdom of Two Celtics and succeeded in winning the support of local peasants in order to drive the Spanish rulers. In 1861, Victor Emmanuel II was proclaimed the King of United Italy. So such questions can be predicted, but the inner, like the between, between places, those are not much important. However, much of the Italian population, among whom rates of electricity was very high, remained blissfully unaware of liberal nationalist ideology. See, the middle class people were only a small amount of the people. The more people were those who were uneducated were or not were very poor. This were the people who were more in number than those of the middle class or high class. The peasant masses who had supported Garbaldi in southern Italy had never heard of Italia and believed that La Italia was Victor Emmanuel's wife. So they were not even that much educated. They thought it was his wife rather than Italia, right? So this was the thing of Italy. They got unified with the king, Victor Emmanuel II, uh, in 1861. The strange case in Britain. So we completed Germany, we completed Italy, now we are moving on to Britain. The model of the nation or the nation state, some scholars have argued, is Great Britain. In Britain, the formation of the nation state was not the result of a sudden upheaval or revolution. It was a result of long, drawn out process. There was no British nation prior to the 18th century. The primary ideal identities of the people inhabited the Italy, the British Isles, um, were ethnic ones, such as English, Welsh, Scot, or Irish. All of these ethnic groups had their own cultural and political traditions. But as the English nation steadily grew in wealth, importance, and power, it was able to extend its influence over the other nations of islands. The English parliament, which had seized the power from monarchy in 1688 at the end of the, con uh, the protracted conflict, was the instrument through which a nation state with England at the center became formed. So what happened is that Britain, uh, people considered Britain as a kind of rule model stuff. Okay, it had it has it had many ethnic groups, different different groups like English, Welsh, Scot, and Irish. These were different different groups. The English one group very sadly they had the more power, they had more people in them, and they grew more in wealth, importance, and power. And hence they were able to extend. If there's more import uh, wealth, power, everything, then obviously there will be more expansion. Huh? And English Parliament was set up, and it became the nation state. And England was was at the center. When Britain was formed, England was, was the center or was the uh, main part. The Act of Union, uh, 1707, I want you guys to remember this, Act of Union. Act of Union between England and Scotland had resulted in the formation of United Kingdom of Great Britain, meant in the fact that England was able to impose its influence on Scotland. So you can understand how much powerful England is in order to impose a power to a neighboring uh, nation state. The British Parliament was henceforth dominated by its English members. The growth of British identity meant that Scotland's distinctive culture and political institutions were systematically suppressed. The Catholic lands that inhabited the Scottish Highlands suffered terrible repression whenever they attempted to assert their independence. The Scottish Highlanders were forbidden to speak their Gaelic language or by traditional or by the national dresses. A large number of the so they all trying to say is that even though they were in a common thing now, English people or English members were given more devils than that of Scottish people. They were not allowed to speak their language, which is Gaelic, and they were not allowed to wear the national dresses. They, were, they had to follow all the things of England, even though after the Act of Union everything took place, there was a unification that yet yeah, this 
sort of repression was still being affected or still being done to the Scottish people. Ireland, similar, okay, now we're with Germany, we're with Italy, now we're with Britain, now we're coming on to Ireland. So for a similar phase. It was a country uh, deeply divided between Catholic and Protestants. Protestants are the people who don't believe in any religion. Uh, the Catholics is the Christian ones. The English helped the Protestants of Ireland to establish the dominance over a largely Catholic country. Catholic revolts against British dominance was suppressed. After a failed revolt led by Wolf Eton, uh, Wolfton and his United Irishmen, Ireland was forcibly incorporated in the, in the United Kingdoms in 1801. A new British nation was formed to the prog uh, propagation of a dominant English culture. The symbols of New Britain, the Britain, uh, British flag, which is the Union Jack, and national anthem, God Save a Noble King, the English language, were actively promoted in the older nations to survive only as a subordinate participant. So, Irish was also eventually put under Britain. Britain had their own national anthem, which was God Save a Noble King. You guys can remember this, uh, you can put it in a uh, point, so it gives a good image, okay? And the British flag, which was a Union Jack, which was called Union Jack. You can see this here. English language is also given much, much, much importance. Uh, the, the revolt of Ireland was under Wolf Dawn. And as Irishmen, they were failed, they failed, and then they were put on, Ireland was put on the British. Okay, now uh, ethnic related to a common racial, triangular, cultural origin, a background, and a community. The same thing, like a sort of group. So this was the part of chapter. We're done with this. Uh, and the next one would be the last two part of the chapter. So in this, it, it is actually bulky. Like we have Germany, we have Italy, we have Britain, we have Ireland. So any of one, any of one, any of this can be asked in an exam, can be asked to describe about what happened. You can, they can ask uh, who was the person under all of them. The main person in Germany was at a one this mark and Italy it was Kewa, we had Mazzini, Garbaldi, and then we had, um, in British, I think we didn't have anyone like as such. In Ireland, it was Wolf Dawn. Uh, which he feared though, though he feared he was the guy there. And the British flag, which is called the Union Jack, then he had the national anthem, which is God Save and Noble King, and the English language. So, this is the part of chapter where we have four descriptions for different states on how they have been formed and how some of them failed, some of them actually got uh, spiked up. So, thank you, and if you like the video, do subscribe to my channel because the next part is going to be soon out. And like to my channel, and if you have any doubt, put it in the comments. So, thank you, and bye bye. See you in the next lecture.